do this event, this ITIF event on the uh, what's really going on in U.S. manufacturing. I'm Rob Atkinson, I'm president of ITIF, and um, uh, what I'll do is I'm going to make some about 20 minutes of remarks, a little longer maybe. We'll hear from uh, Mike Mandel and Howard Weil, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, before I do anything on this report, I, I do want to thank my really two critical colleagues on this report, Scott Andes and, and Luke Stewart, who did really the yeoman's data analysis, which when we started to do this report, I had this this sort of fanciful notion that this was just a question of, yeah, we'll throw a few charts together and recycle a little data we had, and, and it was uh, going to be only take about a week. It was actually an incredibly hard report, uh, and they, they deserve a lot of credit. So uh, today, um, we've got a great panel here, uh, two colleagues and friends uh, who are, will have long slogged away in this field and, uh, and have really, I think, contributed enormously to the debate on manufacturing and measurement. Uh, first is Mike Mandel who is the Chief Economic Strategist at the Progressive Policy Institute, uh, where he focuses on innovation, regulation, and the impact of globalization. Uh, Mike, uh, many of you may know Mike from his long and illustrious career as the Chief Economist at Business Week, where he really did, I think, the most interesting work at Business Week for many, many years, and, and just wrote really a wonderful article, lead article after lead article. And uh, that's why uh, he received the Best Economic Journalist of the Year Award from the World Leadership Forum and a number of other awards uh, for his great work there. He's also a senior fellow at the Mack Center for Technological Innovation at the Wharton School uh, and produces education-oriented videos, economics videos, through his company Visible Economy. And finally, um, uh, uh, Mike has a PhD in economics from Harvard, but for some bizarre reason he seems to have escaped and understood reality. I, uh, <laughs> it keeps chasing you, Rob. Uh, Howard Weil is a fellow at the Brookings Institution Metropolitan Policy Program, and uh, haven't really followed Howard's work. You should. It's really the best work out there, understanding what's happened to the U.S. economy, both in manufacturing and in the urban and regional issues with that. Howard, that's, I don't have a very good bio for you, so uh, PhD, MIT? That's right. Uh, PhD at MIT in economics, and there I do understand how you evolved, because actually at that time economics program at MIT was, was, was pretty good one, uh, at least in terms of Fiori and uh, Mike Fiori and, and Sable and some of those other folks who were there at the time. Uh, so, uh, and also just say, if you haven't seen Mike's piece in the Washingtonian, Washington Monthly. Washington Monthly, excuse me. I the Washingtonian. Uh, the Washington Monthly, I guess perhaps about two months ago, uh, on uh, the failure of measurement and, and, and how we mismeasure productivity, it's really worth looking at. And if you haven't seen Howard's piece, uh, Howard, do you want to hold that up? I guess you'll talk about it. You released a piece last, but about a month ago with Sue Helper on what's happening in manufacturing. Again, very uh, excellent analysis. All right, so can we do the lights? And let me just jump, jump right in here. There we go. Okay. So this is really, I think, the core of what we want to understand and explain. If you look at that in the 1980s, uh, we saw total jobs go up about 18 percent, and manufacturing jobs go down about 7 percent. In the 90s, its total jobs go up about 20 percent, manufacturing jobs down about 2 percent. And then something fundamentally different happened. Manufacturing jobs fell 33 percent, and we had no job creation. Now, there are people out there who refuse to acknowledge that perhaps those two things might be related. <laughs> I'm quite serious. Uh, no relationship between those two things. It seems to me that there is a strong relationship between those two things. We lost a third of our manufacturing jobs, and that is a core reason 
why the U.S. economy did not create any jobs in the last decade. But the real question is, why did we lose those jobs? What, what really happened there? Uh, just to put that in historical perspective, um, that is a greater rate of job loss than in the Great Depression. Now, uh, some, somebody just blogged about this this morning, and they said, I was saying in this report that the economy of today is worse than the Great Depression. No, I was not saying that. Just making a very simple point. Job loss for manufacturing, a greater share of jobs were lost in manufacturing in this last decade than in the peak to the trough of the Great Depression. Uh, we can see that all around the country. Every state except Alaska lost manufacturing jobs. Uh, you can see the a uh, couple of states there, like North Carolina and Michigan, lost an enormous amount. But even the green states, you can see uh, the loss of manufacturing jobs was much broader than it was in the 80s when it was largely a Rust Belt, Northeast, Midwest phenomenon. This is now much, much broader, much more nationwide. And we saw the same thing in, in metropolitan areas. Many, 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 most metropolitan areas lost uh, manufacturing jobs. And Howard's new report is going to delve into that even more. Okay, so how do we explain that? What's going on? This is the uh, dominant story here. This is, uh, we used to employ 70% of Americans were working on the farm, and now about 2% work on the farm. It's not because we're eating less. Uh, it's not because we're importing all our food. It's because we figured out a way to make agriculture incredibly productive, and that was a wonderful progressive thing. Is that what's going on in manufacturing? Well, if you listen to the uh, pundits and the experts, virtually every single one says that's the story. So Nobel Prize winning economists, former heads of the, of the, uh, of the CEA, Council on Economic Advisors, the Congressional Budget Office, everybody has bought into the story that what's going on here is that this is the agriculture story. We lost a third of our manufacturing jobs because of high productivity. Now to be clear, we're not saying that productivity didn't play a role. Of course it played a role. The real question is, did it play the predominant or almost complete role as most of these pundits say it did? And the answer is no, it did not. So one of the problems with this agriculture story is if you buy the agriculture story that manufacturing is fundamentally healthy. In fact, I gave a speech in Chicago recently and uh, describing some of these data. And after my speech was uh, uh, Bill Strauss from the Chicago Fed who stated that US manufacturing has never been healthier in American history and that the loss of 33% of our manufacturing jobs was a sign of enormous strength. So if that's the analysis, then we really don't have to do anything other than perhaps help manufacturing workers who are losing their jobs to transition into new kinds of occupations and perhaps to help some communities that have been hurt transition into new kinds of industries. But other than that, there is no need for a strategy. And that's why I think the analytical failure we've had in the U.S. to understand this is so troubling. All right, so in fact, it's not just the agriculture story. It's also, if you will, a rust nation story. It's a story of decline. And here's why. So if it is productivity, how do we explain these two numbers? By the way, all of our numbers are in real terms and in value-added terms. So value-added is the amount that a, that a company or an industry adds value before they sell. Real means control for inflation. But what you see is a uh, you know, little bit of loss in the 90s, a lot of loss here. Productivity pretty close to the same, not exactly the same. If you look at output productivity, as Howard's report does too, which is another measure, it's actually flipped. It's even, even higher in the 90s. So something more was going on. Uh, so if productivity were the cause, you think, oh, productivity is gone, then what you would expect to see, if that were the logic, if that were the story, you would expect to see relatively uh, relatively um, similar output gains in all the industries. And what you see is dramatically different output uh, trends 
what you see is that 13 of, basically these are the, these are the 19 NAICS codes, in other words, the North American Industrial Classification Codes, various industries, you can see like plastics and rubber products, the paper products, uh, machinery. 13 of 19 of these industries actually saw absolute declines in output from 2000 to 2010. Not in, not, not in nominal, but in absolute terms. So they're producing less today than they were producing a decade ago. And they accounted for 55% of overall manufacturing employment in, uh, in, the, in that decade. The other thing, too, you see three industries that almost didn't grow at all. So you're really only talking about a couple of industries that grew. And then you see this anomalous thing here. <laughs> Need to point. <laughs> yeah, we got it. <laughs> what the heck is going on? Yeah. Oh my God, all these industries go down. There's one industry that's 470% growth of output. The NAICS 334 computers and electronics. What's going on there? Well, by the way, interesting. All of that output, according to BEA, that accounts for 100% of the growth of manufacturing output. Actually, it accounts for 112%. So it accounts for more than all of the growth of manufacturing output is this one industry. So I'm going to come back to the, that in a minute. So if productivity was the cause also, what you would expect to see if that story is true, that this was the best productivity decade we've had in manufacturing ever, you would expect to see capital stock go up really hard to raise productivity without better capital. In fact, what you see here, this orange line, the growth of capital stock, again, in inflation-adjusted terms from BEA, this counts up all the capital stock at the beginning of the decade and at the end of the decade. Machines, computers, fax machines, for factories. And what you can see is that the capital stock grew at the lowest rate, probably leaving out the depression, probably in US history. We don't have data before 47, but you can see that pretty radical trend there. U.S. manufacturers in the 90s expanded their real capital stock by 26%. At the end of the decade, they had 26% more capital. Today, they have just 2% more. It doesn't, it's again, not consistent with the productivity story. Um, again, similar story here in investment decline. You see the growth of a capital investment from 2000 to 2010, you see really only two or three industries that expanded capital stock. One is petroleum and refining. Uh, but everybody else lost capital stock. Again, if productivity is so high, if it's the highest in any industry, what you would expect to see was compensating high profits. Uh, high productivity leads to high profits. The reality is manufacturing profits are the lowest they've been in American history, at least since uh, the 20s. Again, not a story that's consistent with the productivity agriculture hypothesis. Now, that's just using the official data. So you know, all you got to do is look at the official data, and a lot of warning flags, a lot of red flags will pop up. But in fact, it's much worse than that. The official data that BEA reports is fundamentally flawed on three major factors. One is understanding the value of intermediate goods imports. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. This is work that Mike Mandel has done a really a yeoman's work on, and particularly Sue Hausman at the, at the Upjohn Institute. The problem here is that as we've offshored more production, uh, BLS and BEA miscount that when it comes in. So if I was making this microphone and I'm importing that little base, and before I used to make the base and it cost a dollar, now I'm importing it for 50 cents. If I don't attribute that import and price it at the right level, it looks like I'm adding a lot more value in the US than I really am. And when Sue Hausman and others look at that, they find that that has significantly overstated US value added in manufacturing. The second problem, as I mentioned, is computers and rapid technological change. So you have that number up there, 470%. Well, what BEA does is when, uh, if I had a computer, there's a computer in the back of the room, that computer is twice as good as it was in two years ago, has twice the processing power, twice the memory, twice the, all, all these things. According to BEA, 
they'll make two of those. Even when they just make one, they just make one that's better. BEA, it, because they count the improvements in, in Moore's Law, essentially, they count that as an output improvement. Now, because Moore's Law has been so rapid, because the computer improvements have been so great, that that overinflation accounts for most of this uh, and all of the growth in output. Now, if you talk to the Census Bureau and you look at, you look at their actual shipments, what you find is that shipments of computers is down uh, by about 50% over the last decade. Employment is down by half. Again, that's not a story of high productivity. There's really no way that story can be accurate. This is a story of just simply mismeasuring the output of a core industry. The third problem, it's a little bit less, but still a problem, is overstating output in petroleum and coal products. You saw, if you remember that graph, that those were two industries that really, really grew. One was computers, one was petroleum and coal, which is mostly petroleum refining. Uh, BEA says that a real value added of the petroleum industry grew about 70% in the decade, uh, yet the Energy, in Energy Information Administration and DOE says it grew zero, or actually grew about 4%. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, EIA numbers, they look a lot more compelling and I think quite reasonable. Uh, you can see that that's the uh, growth of refining products grew according to BEA just by a really small amount. That's not a 70% increase, that's a very small increase. So you put all of those three factors together, you assume as we did that manufacturing, that computer outputs grew about 22%, not 470%. And that's really the key uh, set of bars right on the far right. Uh, instead of growing 15.3%, we estimate that real manufacturing output declined by 11% in this decade. And partly because of the overstatement of output, particularly in computers, that pulls down overall GDP growth. So you want to know why it doesn't feel good in the economy. It's because GDP growth grew by only 11.3% when actually measured properly. Uh, again, you compare that to the 90s, 39% growth of GDP, the 80s, 37. You know. So this, I think, explains a lot of what's happened in the U.S. economy and a lot of what's happened in manufacturing. We just simply are measuring it wrong. We've seen an absolute decline. We also, that translates into productivity. So again, this productivity story, this agriculture story, if you will, is premised on this notion that manufacturing productivity went up 72% when you readjust it and I think control for these biases in the data, what you find is it actually grew 32%, certainly better than non-manufacturing business output. Nobody's denying that, but it's not such a big gap that it explains all the job loss. And you can see that when measured properly, this is what the, the orange lines are, are our productivity growth. And you can see big reductions in some of these. And again, you can see it this way. It's a little hard to read. Uh, sorry for this. It's hard to read this line, but this is just measuring as BEA does real value add. And what you can see is non-durables, uh, chemicals, paper, these kinds of things, started to decline in 94 as a share of GDP. Uh, but durables, this line right here, compensated and went up. So as a result, people, almost all the economists, almost all the pundits, they look at that top blue line, everything's fine. Manufacturing output is stable as a share of GDP. But the reality is that this line is fundamentally biased. And, if you, and it's biased because of this. This is just computer outputs, electronics computer. When you take that out, you get that top orange line. I think that top orange line is the accurate representation of what's happened to U.S. manufacturing. That is not the agriculture story. That is a decline story. So out of the 5.6 million manufacturing jobs we lost in the decade, we estimate that 3.8 million <coughs> were lost due to output loss. In other words, we were producing less, so you needed fewer workers. Not we were producing more in a more productive way, so you needed fewer. That was the rest of those jobs. That was a that was about the other 1.8 million. Those were lost due to productivity, and that was a progressive force. We want that. We want to help the workers, but we want high productivity. But most of the jobs were lost because of that. If you put a multiplier in there that seems uh, consistent with what all the multiplier data show, it's a pretty big number of absolute job loss. So why is output falling? Well, one theory is, oh, we're just consuming less. We've become a post-industrial society. 
And again, in fact, if you look at the BEA data and you look at manufacturing as a ratio to, but it's in the report, if you look at manufacturing as a ratio of services consumption in real dollars, absolutely no change over the last 25 years. We're consuming the same share of manufactured goods as we did 25 years ago. So it's not that we're moving to a post-industrial society. It's because we're making fewer products, because we're importing a lot more. So these are the trends in uh, manufacturing imports. You can see uh, they really, really started going down in the late 90s. Uh, high tech, an area we always had a trade surplus in now, is negative about $100 billion. So this, to me, explains much more about what's happened. It seems much more intuitive to kind of the story that we hear about plant closures movement overseas and the like. Also, there's a lot of data. One, this is just one graph we have that it's pretty clear from the, from the scholarly research. Import, high import penetration leads to higher job loss. Lower import penetration leads to lower job loss. It's not rocket science. And that's what we've seen in industry after industry. <coughs> but you'll still hear this. People who might even acknowledge this argument will fall back on the second argument, which is, you know, all rich countries are having a hard time in manufacturing. They're all losing manufacturing, so we're not an anomaly. Well, in fact, we are an anomaly. Again, controlling for real value added change, what we find is uh, as share, uh, um, percentage change in manufacturing value added to GDP, we're actually fourth from the bottom. <coughs> I don't really want to be in that company down there, by the way, Italy, <coughs> Spain. Uh, Canada's a good country, but their manufacturing has been terrible. Uh, and the UK has lost manufacturing. I mean, that seems to be their modus operandi, is just lose manufacturing. And look at the countries on the top. Now, some of those you might say, okay, well, Taiwan, you know, Czech Republic, Korea. But Finland, it's a pretty high-wage country, pretty developed country. Sweden. Japan is gaining, though the Japanese basket case, they're gaining. Uh, you know, Germany is losing, but very, very little uh, as a share of GDP. So the story here is um, that, that manufacturing loss is not normal. It's not predetermined. It is a set of factors around competitiveness that countries have some control over. So. All right, so I've painted this unbelievably depressing and grim picture, but hey, we're in the middle of a revival, right? Paul Krugman, manufacturing is a bright spot. New York Times, big, big gains, right? Well, the only reason they seem like big, big gains is because the big, big losses. This is a manufacturing job growth 30 months after the end of the recession. You take every recession before 2000 in the post-war period and 30 months after, we regained every single manufacturing job and then some. We have to, at this rate of growth, have to wait till 2023 to regain all our manufacturing jobs. So, yeah, this is better than 2001. No question about that. But it is not this amazing miracle that we should just sit back and ride the wave on. Again, part of the reason why we're seeing some recovery is because the loss was so significant. The worst manufacturing loss in a recession, other than perhaps the Great Depression. Uh, again, you can see that net gains there, 2010, 2011, uh, but they are dwarfed by the losses uh, in the 2000s and the losses in the recession. And even in the period when the economy should have been doing well historically, you lose manufacturing recession, you can gain it back faster in recovery. In the mid 2000s, we did we did not do very well. Well, the other story here is that there's now international wage convergence. The Chinese are going to be paying massive wages. The Indians, and we just got to sit back and reap the rewards. Uh, I think we got a long way to go for wage convergence with China. According to the BLS data, they're four percent, so maybe they're up to eight percent now. But that's a long way to go. And I, again, I, I, not to say there isn't wage convergence, uh, but it is to say that we've got to fix it. I think that chart is wrong on Germany, by the way. I think it should be. 140. But the point here, by the way, is German wages, 40% higher than U.S. wages. Germany's expanding its manufacturing. It's not shrinking. So there's a lot more going on here than I think the story says. 
Uh, okay. So why is the dominant narrative so dominant? You know, this is, is in some ways it's not uh, it's not rocket science. I mean, Mike has done great work. Howard, Sue Houseman, Dan Luria, at Michigan Tech uh, Manufacturing Institute. I think it's a dominant narrative for two reasons. One, there's flawed data, and uh, there are a lot of people who just look at the data and and they say, okay, well, the data are the data. Um, part of the reason the data are flawed is that BLS funding, BEA funding, has been really been cut. It's it's uh, they don't have the funding, for example, to do the right kind of import price uh, 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 data uh, accuracy. Uh, but the second reason that's just more troubling is why isn't there anybody in the federal government whose job it is, if you will, is to red team this issue? Why isn't anybody in the federal government looking at this data in a hard way and saying, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. Let's at least publish a counter narrative. And that hasn't happened. Um, but the second point is, even with flawed data, you don't have to, you don't even have to get into the kind of Sue Houseman import price, you know, substitution, all this stuff. You just have to look at some things and go, you know, the, that graph is so totally inconsistent with the dominant narrative. If the dominant narrative is a productivity narrative. What you should see is essentially pretty even blue bars all on the right side. That's the narrative, all productivity growth. But you don't. If that's the dominant narrative, you shouldn't see that. So you don't have to dig into data flaws. There's something else going on. So the real question is, what's, what's going on? Why is the analysis so flawed? And I think there's really four reasons. One is, a lot of economists and pundits are very, very reticent to admit that we've lost manufacturing jobs due to trade for a simple reason. They don't want to embolden protectionists. And I've been in meetings where this is a well, yeah, there might be some problems with the data, but if we, if we admit this, then people who are anti-globalization and anti-trade will now have ammunition for their cause. Now, I don't think this tells anything about being anti-global or anti-trade. This says about what we need to do domestically and about enforcing trade rules overseas, which is pro-globalization. So the fact that I think economists do this to me is violating their position of trust, which is they're supposed to provide objective analysis, and they don't. The second reason I think they buy into this narrative so deeply is that they buy into a fundamental belief that markets inherently get it right. And if you believe that somehow that we've lost 33% of manufacturing jobs and it's probably not good, it's probably representing some damage uh, to the economy, then that calls into question a lot of fundamental core economic beliefs that the market always gets it right. The third big problem, I think, is, is, is essentially what you might say timidity and herd mentality. When you have Nobel Prize winning economists, former uh, secretaries of labor, former heads of CEA in both administrations, all saying loudly and vocally, this is the productivity story, it's not anything else, really hard for people to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. And as a result, most economists have just accepted this narrative. I haven't challenged it because challenging it is getting a risk, is, a, is taking a risk. And lastly, I think it's it's uh, partly just related to human nature. I mean, this is to me painful. This is not pleasant to understand. This is painful to understand. This is about the future of our country and what's going to be there for our children. And it's much better to say, "Wow, this is all productivity growth. We are so dominant. We are so great. This is wonderful." <clears throat> Going down the other path is uncomfortable, and a lot of people don't want to do that. We saw that in the housing bubble. Pointing out that the doubling of housing prices in seven years wasn't actually good, why would you want to do that? So I, I think at the end of the day, the, the real problem here is that, you know, four million working Americans almost lost their jobs, and they didn't have to lose their jobs. And yet the narrative is one that says this is not really a problem, it's, it's just natural. And more troubling is the narrative says we don't really need to have a national manufacturing strategy. We don't need to fix this problem because there's not a real problem. So I think at the end of the day, what I think this report hopefully will do, and the goal of it is to make the case that we need a national manufacturing strategy. There's four quick points and I'll close. 
why does it matter? And Christina Romer wrote this op-ed in the New York Times, which was very, very, uh, you know, just reflected a neoclassical bias that, you know, manufacturing massage parlors, what's the difference? And the difference is that when a massage uh, therapist goes out of business, people don't stop getting massages, they just find a different one. When an auto plant goes out of business, people still buy cars, they just might not buy cars from a company that's producing it in the United States. So we, we can't sort of just assume that when we lose this stuff, it comes back. Uh, the other big problem, hope is not a strategy. That seems to be the dominant strategy for a lot of pundits. Well, it's coming back. Let's just sit back and hope. Hope is not a strategy. We need to have a strategy. And on that point, I, I give the Obama administration an enormous amount of credit. They are articulating a national manufacturing strategy. Uh, the president just announced several, I guess maybe last week, I'm, I'm losing track, um, the, uh, a billion dollar initiative for manufacturing technology centers, which is a wonderful thing, which we hope we do. He's, he's enforcing trade agreements more, uh, tax reform and the like. So that's great, but we need to, we need to make that happen. Uh, third, blame is not a strategy. That seems to be our other strategy. Well, we'll just have everybody blame Apple for going to China and everything will be fine. Look, the reason why companies go to China is because it makes economic sense for them to go to China. Our job as policy advisors or policy makers is to make it economic sense for them to do more here. And that means really <coughs> doing this last part. Doing what we call the four T's. We've got to get trade policy right. We've got to fight systemic mercantilism around the country, around the world. We've got to get tax policy right, which means a lower effective rate on manufacturers. We've got to get talent right. We've got to do a lot more on engineering talent, but also uh, sort of frontline core talent. And lastly, technology. Other countries are investing much, much more in their things like manufacturing extension partnership programs, their manufacturing technology strategies. So ultimately, the private sector is going to have to do this. But the public sector can make it, can reduce barriers and can enable this to happen much more easily. And I think that's really what's incumbent upon uh, the government to take action to do that. So I will close with that and uh, turn it over to uh, Mike Mandel. I want to uh, start by uh, congratulating Rob and his team for their epic report on manufacturing, which really covered all the bases and um, I'm hoping will turn out to be a milestone in a uh, extremely important economic and policy debate about the place of the U.S. in the global economy. Because, make no mistake, right, there are two sides to this argument. As Rob pointed out, there's an awful lot of economists and policymakers who believe to the bottom of their soul that the U.S. is doing just fine and that nothing really needs to be done. And um, it's... Uh, a view that's been held by people on both sides of the political aisle, held very deeply by a lot of reputable economists. Against that uh, are the people, actually it's also on both sides of the political aisle, who believe that something does need to be done. Now there's a lot of different solutions. It sometimes is phrased in terms of trade policy, sometimes it's phrased in terms of competitiveness. Uh, corporate types tend to phrase it in terms of competitiveness. Uh, 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 labor tends to uh, phrase it in terms of trade policy, but but there's a lot of people who understand that there the U.S. Uh, could potentially be in big trouble in terms of uh, our global strength, and um, part of this story, as Rob points out, is about the data. Now, four years ago, Sue Hausman and I started our research into uh, the problems of the, uh, the statistics in measuring manufacturing and, uh, and actually uh, more broadly. And we were able to identify pretty easily 
some major, major, major flaws. Flaws you could drive a truck through, flaws where we could go in uh, to the government statistical offices and describe them very clearly. And we thought at that point that, hey, this is going to be easy. We'll point out the problems, and people will say, oh, yeah, this is a, you know, the, the data is just not, just not right. And what we discovered, uh, much to our surprise, though perhaps this shows our naivete, is that you could point out the holes to people and they would nod their head and they say, yes, yes, you're right. And then they'd go off and keep saying what they were saying before. And so this has been about four years. And in fact, I think one of the real gratifications for me in reading this report is that Rob actually was originally skeptical about some of the problems with the data. Okay. And um, and uh, has has you know now dug real deeply as he says uh, into them. But let me put a larger context on this. Right now, what we have in, in globally is a global supply chain economy. Okay, which Apple is a great example. Cross border transactions seamlessly welded. Okay, so that companies sort of shift production from one country to another based on logistics, based on costs. Uh, for, from, the, from their perspective, it's, it's, it's not one country, another country, it's one long supply chain that crosses borders. We're trying to measure this global supply chain economy with national economic statistics. Fundamentally, it can't be done. Right? And so, What's happening is that we're having greater and greater distortions, not just in the manufacturing statistics, but in pretty much every set of statistics that the U.S. government puts out. Probably the least flawed statistics, probably, but it's hard to tell, is the job statistics, because you're actually counting bodies. But a lot of the other numbers that the government puts out have, have dramatic problems with them. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and actually, at this point, uh, Sue and I have a Sloan Foundation grant where we've sort of got um, a lot of, uh, we've sponsored a lot of research for a conference that's going to be held about a year from now that hopefully will push a lot of this forward. Um, and I, I'm going to sort of take this opportunity to sort of flog some of our own stuff. You know, PPI, uh, which I help run at this point, next week we're going to have what could be viewed as a as a complement to, to uh, the ITF report, which is a report on the number of jobs that were lost to imports during the recession, okay, which in involves adjusting the, uh, the import figures and doing a recalculation about what the effect is on the job market. Okay. A little bit after that, we'll actually have an effect, a, a piece on the effect of borrowing on, um, on, on measured productivity sort of showing that the more the more that you borrow as a country, the more it sort of artificially inflates productivity growth. Um, I was so pleased to see the Washington Post article. The big thing here is actually pushing people's awareness forward that the data that we've been relying on, the narrative that we've been relying on, is just not right. Okay. Very, very important, and and I think that I think that the uh, the ITIF report is making a just a tremendous, tremendous contribution to this. So I think that's the best I can sort of say for this at this point. Turn it over to Alan. Thanks, Mike. So I, too, want to congratulate Rob and his colleagues on a superb report, one that really is, the, I think, the most comprehensive um, refutation for a policy audience of the idea that um, uh, uh, manufacturing now is just like agriculture in the past. Um, this should be a standard reference work uh, for policymakers and their staffs and for the many economists, most economists who don't specialize in manufacturing and who are 
fond of trotting out the official statistics and uh, not really giving it a second thought, but making uh, very vociferous arguments on the basis uh, of those statistics. Uh, all those people should be uh, using this report as a standard reference work in conjunction with Rob's previous uh, work on uh, manufacturing, uh, as well as uh, some other work that has come out of some other think tanks, uh, including my own. Um, so, the certainly the, this report is, has, goes well beyond just throwing together a few charts. Um, I guess when we did our last report on manufacturing, we, we had a similar thought that maybe we would just, uh, uh, that it would be easy, we would just throw together a few charts and uh, you know, when you dig into it, uh, it it's, uh, it's harder than it looks. Um, and even though the presentation uh, of the uh, findings is uh, very clear and uh, uh, very accessible to a policy audience, uh, there's a lot of hard work uh, that goes into it. Uh, so I appreciate uh, what, uh, what went into this. I want to uh, focus mainly on the international comparisons uh, aspect of the report, which I found fascinating. In, in general, uh, the international <coughs> comparisons in the report show the United States doesn't do all that well uh, compared to a, a shifting set of other countries um, on a variety of indicators, uh, at least in the pre-publication version of the report that I saw, there were, there were nine different indicators of the health of manufacturing that were ranked internationally among somewhat different sets of countries. Uh, uh, compensation, uh, um, job loss uh, in the last decade, manufacturing share of jobs, uh, manufacturing productivity growth, uh, properly measured, adjusted for the biases that uh, uh, that Mike has pointed out, um, manufacturing output growth, uh, manufacturing share of GDP, um, capital stock, the growth of R&D, and the high tech share of uh, manufacturing output. Uh, the United States doesn't look too good on any of those. Uh, it's at best mediocre. Uh, uh, but I wondered, well, are there other countries that systematically uh, do better, or is the United States just at the uh, middle to bottom of a constantly shifting set of countries, and there really aren't very many countries other than maybe Japan and Germany uh, that do consistently well uh, on uh, all or most of the measures. But actually, if you look at these nine measures, there are a number of countries that uh, do quite well on at least four of them. Uh, heading the list, of course, are Germany and Japan, uh, which beat the United States on seven out of the nine, uh, followed closely by Sweden, uh, which beats the U.S. on six. Uh, Finland, uh, Australia, and France and Korea beat the U.S. on nine, uh, on five, rather. And um, even uh, Italy and the Netherlands and uh, Denmark beat the U.S. on four. Um, so there are actually quite a few countries that do systematically better than the U.S. Now, if anything, I'm understating this case because the comparison countries are somewhat different uh, for each uh, indicator. And I went back to as many of the original sources as I could find and filled in some of the gaps of uh, some of the other countries that weren't reported on uh, in Rob's paper. Uh, but even so, um, you know, there may be others that outperform the U.S. Uh, more systematically. So this is an understatement. Um, what do these countries have that the U.S. doesn't have? Well, one thing is uh, they didn't have big increases in the value of their currency uh, for a number of years in the late 90s and the first part of this century, uh, which uh, contributed uh, to the loss of manufacturing jobs here. Uh, most of them have more favorable tax structures for manufacturing in the U.S., including, uh, uh, in most cases, a value-added tax. Um, and especially importantly uh, for the kind of work that I do, uh, most if not all these countries have much better micro supports for manufacturing than the United States. Uh, policies to deal with the major kinds of market failures that affect manufacturing in any advanced economy. Uh, <coughs> these supports uh, are sometimes manufacturing specific, sometimes they are embedded in, in more general policies. Uh, but they almost always exist, uh, and they are supports for things like the creation and diffusion of innovation, uh, including R&D, uh, workforce training, and the financing of 
uh, new investment in new and existing companies. And the U.S. just doesn't do what other countries do in this area. And the gap is particularly wide in <clears throat> what the report calls uh, medium high-tech manufacturing, not the highest level of high-tech manufacturing, but uh, the, the next level down. Um, if you look at the report, report shows that Germany, Japan, and Korea uh, have bigger shares of uh, their manufacturing output coming from a combination of medium and very high-tech manufacturing and that than the U.S., and that difference is driven by a difference in the share of output that comes from medium high-tech manufacturing, and I don't think that's uh, an accident. Uh, for very high-tech manufacturing, we basically, we have the infrastructure right. We, there are many uh, improvements in our innovation system at the very high-tech level that are needed. Rob and I have written about some of them in a paper from several years ago, uh, but for the most part, we do have public support for basic research. We do have uh, STEM education at the higher education level. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, we do have a venture capital system, uh, so we have some of the we have many of the institutions in place, and uh, they they do need tweaking. Uh, they do need some supplementation, but. Uh, they are in much better shape in this country than our supports for medium high-tech industries, um, which account for uh, much more of manufacturing output than uh, very high-tech industries in the United States. Um, uh, so what do we do on innovation at the medium high-tech level? Well, we have the Manufacturing Extension Partnership uh, Program, which is a great program, but uh, uh, it's only recently been uh, approaching reasonable funding levels, and it has some, some structural flaws uh, that um, make it less effective uh, than it could be. Um, R&D for uh, medium high-tech, well, we don't really do that much of it, um, and we don't, uh, we don't deal with the less sexy um, innovation problems, uh, particularly of small and medium-sized manufacturers uh, in the uh, medium high-tech space. Um, training, well, the whole middle skill part of the U.S. labor market, everything uh, that requires some sort of skill above high school graduation and less than a four-year college degree uh, is, uh, uh, to use a technical term, a mess. Um, it, it's really opaque from both the worker and the employer side. Uh, it's poorly funded, uh, and the manufacturing specific components of that are in even worse shape. Uh, financing, we don't have specialized institutions uh, to finance uh, medium high tech ventures or really anything except the very high tech side of manufacturing. Uh, most of our uh, comparison countries uh, do have. Uh, some kind of more specialized financing mechanism. Uh, so these are areas uh, that the U.S. needs to work on, and like Rob, I um, am very optimistic about the uh, administration's articulation of the manufacturing strategy uh, overall, and uh, I want to, um, you know, I want to see uh, filled in uh, with improvements in these areas. Uh, finally, just a word about the recent job growth in uh, manufacturing in the last couple of years and the uh, phenomenon of uh, reshoring, uh, bringing back work um, from overseas. Uh, there are basically two views about this. Uh, one is that this is just a bounce back from the recession, uh, a, uh, um, a, um, uh, a growth of demand from its uh, uh, cyclical low point uh, for manufactured goods uh, that won't necessarily last. Uh, and that will be followed by uh, you know, more long-term manufacturing job loss if we don't do anything. Or the other view is that uh, it's the beginning of a long-term trend. Now, Rob uh, has made a very strong argument uh, for the former uh, based on data. And um, you know, I can't say that he's wrong, and I, I think I agree more than I disagree. Uh, the argument on the other side um, is that, well, there are some, long some phenomena that are potentially long-term. Uh, that could turn things around, uh, the growth of wages in China, the very, very slow um, uh, increase in the value of yuan, uh, increases in transportation costs, and companies, uh, many companies finally uh, recognizing the costs and coordination um, from offshoring 
um, and recognizing that those sometimes uh, outweigh the benefits uh, just on a purely private basis. Uh, I don't want to overstate those things. Uh, after all, as Rob pointed out, um, it would take till the 2020s just to uh, recover all the manufacturing jobs that uh, we lost since the beginning uh, of the Great Recession uh, at the rate that we've been going in the last couple of years. And uh, in a previous work that I did with Sue Helper, we showed that uh, it would take till 2037 uh, for the country to retain all, regain all the manufacturing jobs that it lost uh, since the beginning of the century uh, at the current rate of growth. Uh, so these uh, these are these long-term phenomena give some reason for policy optimism. They don't. They should not give uh, a reason for complacency at all. If we just uh, sit back and don't do anything, uh, at best, um, if at best, if, if we're talking about anything other than just a purely uh, cyclical bounce back, uh, it'll be another couple of decades uh, before we uh, get back to where we were in 2000. Um, the case I would make uh, that's maybe a little slight difference in emphasis from, from Rob's is that at least policy has, um, has something to work with. At least policy would be moving in the direction, in the same direction as broader long-term uh, world economic trends instead of trying to uh, buck them. And so in that sense, uh, the environment for uh, more favorable manufacturing policy is better now than it might have been five or ten years ago. And that, that's really all I want to claim uh, about reshoring and the, the bounce back of jobs. Uh, without policy, um, at best, uh, we'll have a trickle back of jobs and at worst, uh, we'll be overwhelmed by uh, long-term job declines as we were in the past. Um, so uh, that's what I want to say. And uh, again, congratulations to uh, Rob and his team for a uh, truly outstanding report. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Howard and Mike. I really appreciate that and, and your insights. Um, just a couple of quick responses. One, uh, you actually were much more articulate about our, what our view is. It's exactly the same as your view. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the environment is a better environment for manufacturing than it was seven years ago. Uh, another factor I would add is natural gas, uh, particularly with, with the chemical industry, particularly with suppliers to that in the natural gas industry itself. Uh, so there are some things that are moving more in the direction. I, I guess where I worry is about complacency. It's this we don't really need to do anything. I like Howard's framing better that now is the time to do something because it's at least going in the right direction and we can accelerate that uh, quite dramatically. Um, just on Mike's point about measurement, um, you know, I think that there are now more signs of that happening. Uh, Maypi just released a report yesterday, was it, Stephen, uh, which I encourage you to look at, maypi.org? Yeah, right. Okay. Actually, maypi.net. Maypi.net on uh, that was a very good study on looking at better measurement of imports and exports around the world and how current measurement systems don't get that right. So there is, I think, more uh, attention being paid to this. Uh, last point before I just turn it over to people. Uh, I don't <coughs> acknowledge my colleague Luke. Do you want to raise your hand, Luke? Uh, back. Luke is really the data guru on this. He really spent hours and hours and hours plowing through the data, and, and I think everybody at BEA and BLS is sick of him because he called them all the time to ask him these obscure questions. So uh, thank you, Luke. So let's open it up for, for comments or questions. If you just want to raise your hand. Uh, uh, Stephen, we'll go here first. Yeah, let me just start. Um, Stephen Gold, I'm with uh, the head of Mayfly Manufacturing Lunch for Productivity and Innovation. Rob spoke to our board, in fact, two weeks ago. Rob knows that my uh, our membership is primarily industrial manufacturing, top uh, one, Fortune 1000. A um, couple of things. First of all, excellent report. Uh, my concern is that when you read the Washington Post, when you look at CNN, all the <coughs> coverage is of the alarmist part. It doesn't talk about the need, how, how this reflects a need to maintain a manu <coughs> maintain manufacturing in the country and how you need a strategy. Number two, I think you would be the first to admit, and, and I read your report, Howard, it was very good as well. I read that on a plane a couple of weeks back, coming back, it took me the entire plane flight to go through it. but. Uh, but it was uh, very, very good. Um, I would suggest none of the board members in the room think the Obama administration has a strategy. I, I think they, I th and I'm concerned that that's, that to me is another form of complacency to think that, well, what they're putting forward. I mean, this is good. We're moving the ball down the field, but it's not a strategy. We, you know, we, we supported your four T's. Um, uh, and, but the final one is the question, and that is, Rob, your report, um, 
you know, it shows the defects and, and sh because it paints a rosier picture of in terms of productivity. But on the other hand, the report in terms of measuring gross versus value-added trade, doesn't that, doesn't the current data show a, a, a more, uh, isn't it rosier than the current data shows in terms of uh, our measurement of how we measure gross versus value-added trade? And I guess that's throwing out to both of you because, again, the point is of this of your report was that uh, it's, it's not as rosy as it looks as the data portrays. But on the other hand, if you look at the way we measure trade, tra the trade data is not as bad as we think it is just because of the way that intermediate components are not measured. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll adjust that. Oh, yeah. My, yeah. yeah, let's push the button. Push the button until something exciting happens. Okay, thank you. Oh, just push it once. Just once. Push okay. It so, it's, it's technology in action. Okay, we got it now. Okay, so so on the value added trade, okay, we obviously should be measuring trade and value added uh, as a value added basis rather than a gross basis. The problem is that applies to exports as well. Okay, so it would be really, really, really great to be able to track imports through our economy, okay, to see where they're going in exports. It'd be really great to be able to track, you know, flows of trade around the world. Now there is a there is a um, uh, there's some attempts coming out of Europe, okay, the uh, uh, World Input Output Database, which is uh, uh, under construction and is going to release the next version soon, okay, has been making attempts to sort of track value-added trade. Um, the real problem that I have at this point is, is that um, um, it's really sort of a symptom of the same thing that Ralph thinks. Kind of the, the 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 mindless acceptance of the numbers as sort of actually demonstrating what you want them to demonstrate. So on the one hand, you've got the ex, our exports, you know, like aircraft may include a lot of imported parts. On the other hand, on the other hand, our what we import may include a lot of both parts made in the U.S. but also uh, um, intellectual capital from the U.S. Okay. So the first step is to sort of get people to understand that that. What they are looking at may not mean what they think it means. Okay, and at that point, okay, we can have a really good discussion about whether things are better or worse than we think. But the first thing to do is to sort of dislodge from 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 people's head this idea that oh, we actually know what's going that we know what's going on. In fact, the more that I study this, the less that I think that I actually know about 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 the relationship between the global, the U.S. and global economies, and and, and this is actually pretty a, a pretty distressing thing. So you and I could sit down and have a very reasonable discussion about whether the numbers are, you know, the factors that would make things better and worse than they look than they than they look, and and but the real problem is, okay, is that we simply don't know. And let me actually give you an example that I mean, some of the people in this room know, but some people may not. The the Bureau of Economic Analysis has no idea what parts of the economy imports are being used in. So there's an assumption that's called the import comparability assumption. So what they do is an import comes into the U.S. and they distribute it randomly across the, the, the across the economy. Okay, that is, they sort of say, okay, you know, an import comes in. We'll sort of say it goes to consumption and investment in this industry and this industry the same way that Domestic manufacturing, domestic goods are. Okay. We don't know, so we're just going to assume it does. And what it means is that all of our calculations about multipliers, okay, about the effects, what, which export industries we should really be pushing, where in fact we're winners and losers, we have no idea. We just don't have. We just, we just don't have a clue. So the fact is, is that, is that. You're absolutely right about exactly what you're saying. That we should be looking at value added as opposed to net rather than gross. But boy, okay. And it went you know, it's a hard road to sort of convince people that the numbers need to be need to be changed. Camilla and then Hi, my name is Camilla Paul Radberg. I'm science counselor at the Swedish MC, and thank you very much for this uh, great report, and also that you're coming back to this uh, topic of manufacturing strategy. I think it's uh, of great importance. I have a uh, question to all of you. Uh, you're mentioning very much the jobs within manufacturing when we talk about the need for a manufacturing strategy, but how do you see that the lack of focus on manufacturing will affect other parts of the value chains? Uh, what I'm 
what I would like to come into is, for instance, how much does it affect that you move out of the manufacturing to another country also affect R&D? In the 80s, we saw that it was very important where you had the headquarter. Where you had the headquarter, there you would have the manufacturing and the R&D. Do we see another picture today that where you have the manufacturing, there you also will eventually move the R&D? Because many of these countries in Asia are becoming better and better also in those areas. So it's becoming even harder than to get it back. Okay. Howard, do you want to take a crack at that? Or? Uh, I, 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 I might. You want to start? Yeah. The, the best case here, okay, the best case scenario is the Apple scenario. All right? So we know what the best case looks like. The best case looks like a company that has uh, successfully used innovation Separate innovation from manufacturing, use innovation as a tool for managing a supply chain. Okay, a very potent tool. Okay, then we have cases of comp then we have cases of companies, okay, which are who I will not mention, who have failed to do this. Okay, and I'll actually give you an example, which is not a high tech industry, but not with furniture. What the furniture companies did, furniture manufacturers in the U.S. did, is what they did was they is they. Um, when they outsourced their production of furniture, they also outsourced kind of their intellectual capital and how to sort of like put coatings on tables and so forth, kind of the, the minutia of how you sort of turn a piece of wood into a viable piece of furniture. Okay. Once they did that, they had sort of lost the whole game, right? So that was, so that was a case where an, in, a, an industry which was innovating slowly just kind of gave it away. And so the real, the real, interesting, the real interesting question for me is goes down to sort of it, it, do you think of yourself as a country which uses innovation as a competitive tool okay in which case you can imagine that the separation of R&D from innovation war, from manufacturing works okay and that's kind of a global national that's a national strategy or I, I've, I've always been struck by companies that sort of told me that say look you know the fact is is that a lot of money is made on the downstream end when you actually build the stuff. So we like to keep the we like to keep the building in order to keep enough money to fund the R and D. So, you know, I, that's kind of an I, I see to see this as yeah, it's possible to sort of make it work, but it's a hard strategy. It's a hard strategy. Um. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, whether you could separate uh, R and D from from production you know, varies depending upon the kind of production process, the kind uh, kind of industry, and, and possibly also uh, the particular company. Um, Erica Fuchs of, uh, of Carnegie Mellon University uh, recently did a study. Uh, in which she, she looked at this issue in uh, the uh, auto and photonics industries and uh, uh, found that um, you know, in, in autos, uh, you, you, know, you, can offshore, um, you can offshore production uh, without losing your uh, capacity to innovate. In photonics, uh, you, you really couldn't. Uh, and so what she, what she suggests is that really the, the higher tech, more early stage uh, process technologies are ones uh, where the, the production process really has to be uh, in uh, fairly close physical proximity uh, to, uh, uh, to R&D and possibly in uh, at least some <coughs> more mature technologies, uh, maybe that's, uh, that's less necessary. I'd just add to that also, there's, there's sort of this view that this narrative in the U.S. in the 80s and 90s was, well, we, we'll lose textiles, we'll lose some of those things because, you know, we're not very good at it. We got the high tech. And then, and then we started to lose high tech production, and now the narrative is, well, we're, we, we'll do this other stuff. We'll do design, we'll do R&D. And the reality is every or most major countries are focusing on that now. Uh, that's the entire Chinese strategy. You look at growth of corporate R&D, you look at growth of government R&D and our major competitors, and it's very, very robust. <laughs> Uh, it's sort of the same as the clean energy story. Well, we lost manufacturing, but we'll do clean energy. <coughs> Everybody wants to do clean energy. Everybody wants to do a design. I mean, you look at some of these European countries, they have really serious design strategies. So this notion somehow that 
we, we just have this natural right to this kind of good stuff. And, and it's, I think, a very dangerous uh, view that, that it's somehow not going to be competitive there, but it is competitive here. It's very competitive there, and we've got to be good at all of it. So um, let me go here, and then... I just have an observation and then a question. <clears throat> the observation is that uh, uh, the terms high-tech often give a wrong notion of what you're talking about. Uh, Michael, for example, just gave the example of furniture, and he prefaced it by saying, well, furniture is not high-tech. The implication is, who cares if we have furniture? I didn't say that. I know you didn't say that. I didn't say that. But people draw then the conclusion that. that when people talk about <laughs> we really want high-tech manufacturing only, they don't understand that furniture has high-tech. Auto parts have high-tech. Tool and die makers have high-tech. And yet, people don't understand that. So when you use high-tech, people think you're talking about Hewlett Packard jobs or IBM or something like that. And so the more we use only high tech, the more uh, economists in general leave the image that we only want a certain kind of manufacturing. And all these other sectors, <coughs> who cares if they go abroad? The question I have is, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a spate of reports issued on the auto parts industry and the level of Chinese subsidy going into that. Uh, so my question to you is, um, there are probably five or 600,000 jobs in the United States in the auto parts sector. Uh, and uh, the Chinese obviously have designated autos as a pillar industry, and um, obviously auto parts uh, are rising here in the United States. So do we wait until this industry is decimated under U.S. trade laws to do something about it? Um, here's a case where what do we do to retain a strong auto parts industry? Here's a specific issue. As you know, most of the cases that Congress deals with for the administration are not broadly manufacturing. They come in specific bits and pieces. Um, here's a pretty big bit, piece coming along. What would you guys suggest we do with the auto parts sector? Well, two things. One, to respond to your first point, I, I think it's, a, it's an important point, and I would say we don't, we don't want to focus on high-tech industries, we want to focus on high-tech firms. Or another way to do that is, as Howard's terminology, is high-road firms. In other words, firms that are using technology <clears throat> and workforce skills <clears throat> and automation capital investment to be competitive. There are a lot of firms that do that, and there are some firms that don't do that. It's the firms that don't do that that I'm less, uh, I have less concern for. Uh, we need to be helping and encouraging firms to be those kinds of firms, whether it's in, uh, you know, in the computer industry or whether it's in the textile industry. <coughs> on your point on autos, uh, you know, our trade policy is largely, the fact that we do any of it, which we do some now, doing more of it, is, is largely reactive. There has to be a lot of harm done. We, we take a long time, and then we respond, and the harm is done. The fact that we have a standard under the ITC for harm, to me, is, is a fallacious notion. That we, it can't be harm. It has to be, it can't, can't be harm in terms of actual harm. It has to be harm in terms of we, we, we could have gained, but we didn't. Uh, and and that's not the standard. And so, I, you know, we released a report a couple of weeks ago on uh, confronting Chinese innovation mercantilism, and we argued that the Chinese trade strategy and economic strategy is systemic mercantilism to gain absolute advantage. And there's no way we can respond to it on a case by case basis. We have to elevate that at a much higher and more strategic level. So. Yes, I hope we respond on auto parts, but we can't do whack-a-mole with China. We will continue to lose if we, you know, they'll come up with the next one. You know, we're, now we're doing solar after we've lost, you know, how many solar companies and solar jobs. We're finally getting around to responding to that. We've got to intervene much, much earlier and force the Chinese and the Brazilians and the Indians. I mean, the Indians now have a new policy that I th think this is, by, I may get the dates wrong, by 2020, some outrageous number, like 80% of, uh, of, of computers, and they have to, have, by law, have to be produced in India. I mean, this is just outrageous. And uh, now U.S. government is fighting that, but, but these are the kinds of big challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, yeah, Pat. Pat, you want to stand up to say yeah. who you are? If you were... You want to say who you are? I'll oh, Pat Malloy. I'm 10 years with the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. If you were to make an argument, and I've told people there's more interest in manufacturing now in, in policy circles in, in Washington, but if you were make, to make the argument why manufacturing matters, is that old book, is it, is it because we can't balance our trade? Because so much of our trade deficit is, in, is involved with 
importing manufactured goods. Is that the key reason, or is it something else that manufacturing makes a higher standard of living for your people, or is it both? Or how, what would be the key argument that you would make to policymakers why you have to really have a manufacturing strategy for the country? Right at this point, right at this point, I think I think both points are true, but I would just stress the first point. <coughs> right now, we're running a, 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 an economy where consumption exceeds production. Okay, and people sort of talk about consumption being the prime goal of the economy. Okay, and I think we need to sort of shift to uh, to a, a, a narrative where where production becomes more important than consumption. That we have to start thinking of ourselves as production oriented. So that puts more of an emphasis on manufacturing because obviously that's producing things, but it also puts more of an emphasis on other types of production as well. Okay, sort of, uh, you know, I recently did a report on, on the app economy and the jobs being generated by that. Okay, and so we have to think of ourselves as being productive, production oriented across a wide range of different things, of which one an essential part is manufacturing. Um, um, I'm sort of, I think I'm less comfortable than, um, I, I don't feel the need to sort of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, go the next step to sort of talking about manufacturing in particular, except as to sort of make the point that if we close the trade deficit, we will inevitably generate jobs in manufacturing, okay? That's the only way to do it. And in fact, we've got a paper that I didn't mention, we've got a paper coming out in about a month from now that talks about exactly that. That, that issue? That exactly that PPI? issue. PPI? PPI. Okay. I'd love to get a copy exactly of that. Exactly that issue, which is right on point. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we, 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 th we think about it um, uh, really in terms of uh, four main contributions that manufacturing makes that are, they're not totally unique to manufacturing. And we're, our argument is not a manufacturing fundamentalist view that only manufacturing matters and all manufacturing matters equally, but uh, uh, you know, there are some pretty durable advantages to, uh, to manufacturing in wages, uh, you know, controlling for everything else we could control for in standard government data. Um, you know, manufacturing still has an 8.4% wage advantage uh, over other industries uh, in innovation by virtually any available measure of innovation. Manufacturing accounts for the bulk of it uh, on trade. Again, um, you know, uh, you would, it, it's, it's going to be much harder to uh, move toward a bal toward balanced U.S. trade uh, if uh, at least without huge declines in our standard of living due to exchange rate adjustments uh, if we uh, don't have manufacturing capacity here than, than if we do. And uh, uh, manufacturing is also important if and when we uh, ever decide to get serious about uh, a low carbon economy, uh, which is not, not looking very promising right now, but uh, you know, a lot of what's needed to create a low carbon economy is manufactured products. So we think, we think about it in terms of those four advantages, and there are reasons why manufacturing uh, is going to or probably outperform other sectors of the economy in creating those advantages for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, it's not that only manufacturing will, and it's not that all manufacturing will equally, uh, but there are, there are reasons why, in general, uh, manufacturing is going to have an advantage on those things. Manufacturing plants are still generally bigger than other, gener other business establishments, and they're generally uh, more capital intensive, and both of those things lead uh, to higher wages. And that probably will continue to be the case. Uh, um, innovation. Um, you know, we basically don't know how to do service sector innovation on a broad scale. Yes, IT has helped a lot, um, but it's not just IT, but figuring out how to uh, realign uh, you know, business and, and work processes outside of manufacturing uh, to create really durable productivity gains. And we, we don't know very much about how to do that in manufacturing uh, for all of the, the problems that uh, uh, you know, that we pointed out, uh, at least there, uh, at least we have an idea of how to generate uh, productivity gains, and we have some experience uh, in doing it. Um, now, on trade, um, 
you know, most of, uh, you know, almost all manufacturing is, uh, is tradable, uh, while a growing uh, share of non-manufactured pro- uh, services are, uh, are tradable. Um, you know, that, uh, and that growth has been relatively rapid, it's still, the, the end result still pales in terms of, uh, of manufacturing. Um, so, um, uh, so yes, uh, manufacturing matters for, for those reasons, and it will probably continue to matter uh, for the foreseeable future for those reasons. So, so I have a similar but slightly different view. Number one, I think, is uh, defense industrial base, uh, you know, I think the Defense Department is really missing the boat, uh, that the health of the defense industrial base is weaker than they will uh, acknowledge. And it doesn't really matter now, uh, because we're not really fighting a war where we can't, you know, import the kinds of uh, weaponry and weapon systems we need. But it could it could really matter at some point. And then when that happens, it's going to be a very, very difficult ballgame. Uh, when we want to import certain parts for missiles and things like that, and our enemy is the major producer of those parts. But I think the other major reason, though, and to me, I, one of the problems I have with the way manufacturing has been framed, it's been largely framed as a social policy issue. There are these workers out there with less than college-educated degrees, and we want to help them. Uh, that's good and true, but that's not what you can base an economic policy on. That's not going to convince the people of Treasury. Treasury doesn't do social policy. Uh, CEA doesn't do social policy. So this is about economic policy, and the core argument is to me about, it's about traded sector, non-traded sector. And that's where I really like Michael Spence's work recently, six, eight months ago, he did a report, Nobel Prize winning business economist. <clears throat> and um, neoclassical econ- economics rejects the notion they just simply reject the notion that there is a difference between, in any meaningful way, between a traded sector and a non-traded sector. So when I was head of the Rhode Island Economic Policy Council 15 years ago, I remember uh, inter- I had, had before I was I was leaving, and, and there was somebody else coming in to take a different position, uh, running the economic development. I had, I had breakfast with him before his Senate confirmation hearing, and uh, I mentioned something about the fact that you know. The state doesn't have to worry about its barbershop industry, uh, that that's going to be healthy no matter what we do, that people aren't going to go to Massachusetts to get their hair cut. Uh, and he said, no, well, I learned in graduate school, which is unfortunately economics, that all <laughs> industries are equal. <laughs> and it didn't take him very long in the job to realize that that was, kind of, that was kind of lame, that virtually every state in the country doesn't have a barbershop policy. And by that I mean that I mean, I, I remember in graduate school, the second week of my course on regional economics was the difference between non-traded and traded sectors, or what they would call economic base and non-economic base. In other words, residentially serving industries, industries that where the demand and the supply are linked. Well, you know, case in point would be a local government. Uh, you know, we're not going to buy our local government services from <coughs> Personal services, uh, health, a lot of health care, all of these <laughs> grocery store, most most retail, uh, most of those are just going to be provided in the U.S. regardless of what happens to those industries. So when Crate and Barrel goes bankrupt, I think that's the one that went bankrupt. It doesn't really matter uh, because uh, the J.C. Penney is going to take their market or whatever. But when uh, General Motors shuts down plant after plant after plant, and that's replaced in by foreign production, uh, if it's replaced by domestic production by foreign firms, that's one thing. Or when uh, our furniture industry is loose, we're still going to buy the cars, we're still going to buy the furniture, but we'll buy them from overseas. And therefore, that automatic demand doesn't get put back into the economy uh, on the supply side. And, and that's, to me, the simplest and most basic reason why you have to have a healthy traded sector. And, you know, we focus on manufacturing here, but in reality, what we're really talking about is, is a traded sector policy. So, you know, you get companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft. Those are just as important. I mean, those are traded sectors. They're selling their output around the world. So, anyway, long answer, Pat, but I just think, at the end of the day, that's really why this matters. We have to have a policy that makes sure our traded sector is healthy, because without that, the, as they say, you know, you're, you're leaning into the wind, if you will. You're, you're sort of having contractionary effects every single day. When we lose a plant every three days over the last 10 years, uh, that's a contractionary effect. That, you know, when we lose a barbershop every three days, it's not a contractionary effect. Yep.
So I think we have time for maybe one more question, Andrew. Um, hi, Andrew Greenberg with George Washington University, and I have some comments in the uh, comments have to do about the, the data issue, and that institutionally, um, the difficulty in getting the data we need, sometimes it's in the agency, the statistical agency, uh, the agency uh, uh, doesn't understand the problem. Um, uh, because they're, speak louder, um, because their their legacy job one for BLS and for BEA is to serve the macroeconomists in the federal government um, around fiscal policy and monetary policy, so not around structural policy, and so and it's a whole there's a whole legacy culture, and um, it's, so sometimes it's 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 un, it's unwillful, it's just blind spot. Sometimes it's willful. They they don't want to look embarrassed, um, but. It's, a lot of times, in, in, in the instance of the uh, import-export price crisis and how U.S. prices compare to other countries, BLS knows full well what the problem is. And the guy who runs the BLS prices program um, has a slideshow that ratifies what we heard this morning. The issue is, and I've seen a 20-page uh, set of proposals that BLS has put, that his unit has put together about what the federal government can do to improve uh, uh, price indices, uh, uh, comparing U.S. to other places, for a minimal amount of money, probably $20, $25 million. Um, and that proposal is not going anywhere. It's not in the budget, um, BLS budget. So I don't know what the roadblock is, but there is an opportunity. There's a new BLS commissioner that will be um, confirmed here. <coughs> a VP for the New York Fed, and who is not a captive of the culture, and so hopefully she, I mean, she she's seen, she knows this issue, so hopefully she'll give it some priority. But but even if the, even if the agencies understand what's going on, um, OMB can be a roadblock, and Congress can be a roadblock. So sometimes OMB will say to the agencies, come in with budgets that are five percent below last year for contingency. So the, the agencies have to come up with cuts. So one of the cuts they've come up with the last two years, that if this program is cut, Rob couldn't, and Howard couldn't make their presentations as well. It's the International Labor Comparisons Program, $2 million, right? Now, one analogy I make is the average MBA salary is $5 million, okay? So BLS sends up to OMB this cut, because it has to come up with something, and it doesn't want to cut its core programs, and OMB accepts it. So it's really OMB's, the people at OMB are making decisions to eliminate things, not understanding the, the value. The US doesn't want to cut the thing, it has to come up with something. And then the third thing is even if it goes through the agency and OMB, Congress is less than receptive to new initiatives. So case in point, right? Obama, the Obama administration is doing this whole select USA thing, right? We're going to attract foreign investment. Well, for two years running, DEA had a $3 million proposal to improve the FDI statistics. So we can better understand what companies are, are, are investing in the U.S., in, largely in manufacturing. And um, Congress didn't approve it two years in a row. So BEA gave up. Um, but uh, they wanted to do it. They, they understood the problem. Uh, so um, th those are issues that need to be addressed uh, um, by us at these points of you know, where the barriers are. Um, so que the questions are one, if you think about the policy, like Rob and, 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 and Mike and Howard, if you were advising the president and saying, okay, <coughs> we, need a, we need a manufacturing strategy, we need, a, we need a, an economic strategy, what are the qualifications of the people that you would recommend? Because macroeconomists are not trained in this stuff. You have CEA, macroeconomic oriented, having to deal with stuff it doesn't fully understand. Um, so that's okay. great. I mean, I have a couple points, um, and then we're, we need to stop in three minutes. Um, you know, you, you may, Andrew, you mentioned this point about FDI. I mean, we, as far as I can tell, I've looked and maybe I just can't find it, but I don't believe that we have FDI data that differentiates between Greenfield and, and purchased investment. So this is a pretty important thing to understand. And, and that was in the proposal? Yeah. 
So our, you know, our, when everybody says, oh, we want more FDI, well, we actually should be very careful about that. If, for example, the Chinese increased their FDI dramatically and it was to purchase U.S. companies and then move the technology overseas, is that a good thing or a bad thing? How would we know that's happening? Now, on the other hand, if the Chinese FDI strategy is we're going to actually open up plants in the U.S., a, little, a lot like what the Japanese strategy changed to be, Toyota opens up a factory, Nissan opens up a factory, that's quite different. And under our data system, we have no way of really knowing that other than anecdotally. So, Could I add a point on that, Rob? Sure. Because uh, four years ago, we did at one point collect the difference between Greenfield and acquisition. And th uh, during the Bush administration, they stopped that distinction, I think maybe to hide the fact that so much of it was acquisition. No, it was, be it was because of a last minute budget. <laughs> budget okay, budget. for whatever reason, yeah. that, that went out and they've never been able to get it back. I think it's a very important issue. Yeah, and Rob, it was about 90, 90 to 10. 90% was acquisition, 10% was Greenfield. Most of it's yeah, acquisition. Those are pretty brutal, you know. Yeah, so I guess to Andrew's point is, you know, if we really want to, you know, figure out what the ship is doing, where are we going, are we in good position or bad position, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, you know, we can't do that now. We are essentially flying the plane yeah. blind. There's no radar. And we have little kind of points here. Where we have, and, and the only way to do that is A, more money, B, a different kind of attitude about statistics, and, and a kind of a, almost a new strategy, if you will, about the kinds of analytical work we need to do, and, and, and we're not doing that. Mike, you're how are you just a short one. Let me just tell you a little anecdote from my previous life as a journalist. Okay, I used to call up economists and sort of say, well, what do you think about you know, economic statistics? Do you think more money should be spent? They said, yeah, yeah, more money. Then I would sort of ask them whether it was a, a, an economist who had been in a policy-making position. I would sort of say, do you think that you made any bad policy decisions because of a lack of data? And they would say, oh, no, I didn't make any bad policy decisions. Okay, I, I did just fine. And then you sort of ask, you ask them, you ask them, you know, did you, did you, did, did it, it was any of your research flawed because of the bad data? And they say, no, 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 I accounted for all the bad data in my research, everything was fine. Okay. And so, you know, the, the, the point that I would make is that, is, that, is, that, is that what we actually need, okay, is people to stand up and say, we are making bad decisions because of the bad data. And right now, the economics profession, the economic policy making profession have been basically abrogating their responsibility to say that. I would say that the one, I just need to say, that the one person who actually admitted that bad data led to bad decisions was Michael Boskin, who was, talked about bad trade data in the 1980s, on the, you know, in, in the later years of the Reagan administration, having led to some 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 bad bad trade decisions. Okay, so I would sort of actually go right to the point and sort of say, okay, it's not the place of the agencies to make this argument. Okay, they're not they're not designed to make these arguments. It's the place of it, it, you, know, you have to sort of say, like Rob has been saying, like I've been saying, like Howard's been saying, that bad data leads to bad decisions, and here's some real cases of it. Okay, and I think actually, when it gets down to it, that's what Congress needs to hear to be responsive to the demand for 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 to, to be able to sort of allocate more money. You have to sort of say, if you don't allocate more money, we can't make, these are the mis sort of mistakes that, are, that have been made. And nobody wants to admit mistakes. So to, to, that, to that point, it buried in the BEA appropriate, uh, congressional uh, budget, it sends the Congress. Yeah, we're really sure. We really sure. It's an admission. We didn't have the data we needed to see the recession. And the reason they didn't have the data was because they've been trying Census has been trying for 10 years to get 8 million bucks to survey services industries, including finance and insurance, at the same frequency of quarterly and annually that they survey manufacturing. And they couldn't get it. So BEA didn't have the, it had to interpolate what's happening with the key, the industries that started the recession by looking at the data in the two, the, two, the economic center. <coughs> and they got the money, but it was too late. Andrew, that, that had no, no effect on the economy. <laughs> Minor little blip, what was it? Two or three trillion dollars? <laughs> Cost benefit ratio doesn't work on that one. Ah. Uh, case in point. Uh, so, anyway, first, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, and I really want to thank Mike, Mike and Howard. Great comments, great insights. So, thank you. Another report that I have seen that's larger.
margin of those that can come out of the kinsman. <laughs> <laughs> Coming out with another big one. <laughs>